I'm so delighted to be here. What an amazing experience of heaven on earth here this morning with great, great worship, prophetic ministry. Um, and so you really have the capacity to transform lives when you come to church here. A lot of times people just come to church to uh, fulfill an obligation and to have, uh, you know, something ratcheted up that they've done and it hasn't done anything for them though. And, and I thank God that you guys really know how to bring uh, that combination of the spirit and the word in this house. So I'm just thankful to God for your pastors and for uh, them trusting me to come here and um, thanking God for the relationship I have with Bishop Hammond and CI for many, many years now, for probably since the early 2000s, so about 15 years. And the great uh, legacy that all of you have and you're part of globally and what this church is doing globally as well with the, the great influence, not only uh, in the word, but also the great worship impact, as you could see in the DNA of your church, the name of your church, um, and the fruit that you see here uh, with the biological and spiritual sons and daughters. It's amazing. Um, before I share, uh, I did bring three mini books. They're all in the kingdom of God, which I'll be talking about today. And I also want to thank Christy and Rich for uh, connecting me to the pastor, uh, Robert and Stacy. And I'm just thankful for their friendship and always praying for me and even giving me prophetic words when I need it. Um, and so thank you for that. And uh, so anyway, three books I brought, three mini books. They're the last three books I wrote. One is 25 Truths You Never Heard in Church. Basically, I was thinking of uh, the kingdom of God and 25 essential things that is taught in the Bible that personally I never heard once preached in 40 years being in church on Sunday that the average person in the body of Christ doesn't know. So that's his book. A lot of pastors are using this to give their uh, church a biblical worldview, discipling people, going week by week, 25 weeks, 25 lessons. This book it was a download the Lord gave me on understanding how the whole Bible is interpreted. If you want to be a gatekeeper, if you want to learn how to disciple gatekeepers, uh, this book will teach them how to apply the law of God in culture and how the absence of the law of God has created the mess in culture we're in today. And it also shows you the relationship between the law and grace a lot of confusion about law and grace. So this actually will connect the Mosaic law with the Beatitudes of Matthew 5. Believe it or not, it can actually happen and it's very simple once you see the, uh, the, the download there. This is the last book I wrote. Some people think it's the best book I ever wrote on the kingdom uh, because it's not very theological, but it has a lot of insight. Another download I got and preaching this in different places and it's like a nuclear bomb dropped and every leader, I don't want to say every leader, but many leaders who read this, especially uh, national leaders, they, uh, James Robeson ordered 200, um, somebody else ordered uh, several hundred. I just got another order of 150 going to 250 of the wealthiest families in America that are serving God. So this book uh, really has the potential to be a, a bestseller on the kingdom for just the average person who doesn't have a lot of theological background, but uh, it'll really be helpful. Also, there's a website, josephmatera.org, just my name, and there's 10 books. This is only three, and uh, many, many podcasts, videos, YouTube station, and a daily uh, dose of articles. Okay, so Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray that you'd help us understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. So wherever I go, I get a download, and I usually get confirmation on what I'm supposed to minister on. And this is no exception. One of the songs you sang focused on part of the text of what I'm going to be sharing. And uh, I usually don't have a script. I don't use notes. And if I had known all the scriptures I was going to read today, I would have put it all on an iPad. So I uh, had no idea it was going to be like this until I walked in. 
So even though some people think I'm a teacher, I really prophesy teach because I see what I'm about to say and get downloads. So that was, that's my primary ministry really is, is that of a prophet, uh, not a, uh, let me say prophetic. And, uh, and that's the mode that I use. Uh, and uh, I don't go around calling myself a prophet, even though I believe people are called to that uh, in this day and age. Okay, so Lord, thank you, God, for breathing on this. Thank you. So what I want to talk about is the gospel of the kingdom. Someone say gospel of the kingdom. And I want to start off with a very familiar passage to a typical Jew. It's the passage in the Old Testament in the Pentateuch that they memorize and they say um, and is the one passage that their faith, the Hebraic faith is centered around. And we're going to go to the Shema in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And before I say this, um, I want you to understand that Anyway, the premise of this book is that about 150 years ago, we separated the gospel from the kingdom. We separated the gospel from the kingdom. There's a lot of historical reasons why we did that, but sometime after the Civil War, we stopped preaching the kingdom of God and separated it. Uh, and the gospel became a standalone thing, the good news. And when we separated the gospel from the kingdom, we were left with a narcissistic, self-focused gospel because the kingdom is what obligates us to commit ourselves to creation, to community, to serving humanity. When we separated the kingdom and the gospel, it left us with good news for an individual. It individualized our faith. That's the... 15 chapters here, resulted in narcissism, uh, resulted in a prosperity gospel that's out of whack. Uh, a lot of men stopped coming to church. Uh, we stopped dealing with principalities and powers and started just dealing with individual demons because we're not dealing with the princes that rule nations because they're concerned about the kingdom. We're just dealing with low-level demons now. Uh, there's a lot of implications of when we stopped uh, preaching on the kingdom of God. So Paul, it says in the book of Acts in three particular places, especially the last chapter of Acts 28, it summarized his preaching as preaching the things concerning the kingdom. You can see that in Acts 20 and uh, one other place. And so it's Acts 28, Acts 20 and another location. John the Baptist preached on the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He preached, it says in Mark 1, 16, the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. So you really don't have good news if you don't have the kingdom and good news together. And I'm going to try to explain why the gospel is not the gospel without the kingdom and its original uh, setting. And so... When we think about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is not the church. The kingdom of God is the rule of God that emanates or proceeds from the throne of God in heaven. So the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are used interchangeably because it's basically the same thing. And so God's personal being is in heaven. He sits on his throne Metamorph uh, as a yeah, metaphor, you could say he's sitting on a throne, whether he's sitting on a throne or not, I don't know. Nobody knows, but the personal rule of God comes from the personal being of God, and that rule affects the whole universe. So in that sense, in the sovereign rule of God, even the devil is in the kingdom or under the control of the kingdom. That's why it tells us in Job chapter 1 and 2 that Satan had to ask God permission before he tested Job. The New Testament, Jesus said in Luke 22, Peter, Satan has asked permission, desired to tempt you. In other words, even the devil is limited by the rule of God. 
But Jesus ramped it up to another level in Luke 11, in Matthew 6, verse 6 to 9, Luke 11, verse 2 to 4, when he taught us the Lord's Prayer, which is an amazing prayer to recite. I could preach on that. Um, But um, he said, now, when I'm announcing the kingdom, because the kingdom rules over all, there was always a kingdom when it comes to cosmology, natural law, metaphysics, subatomic physics, all of that, Uh, is already in the kingdom. But when he announced the reign of God, he was saying, now I am bringing the kingdom of God and I want you to pray for his kingdom to come or his reign or his government to come on earth as it is in heaven. So here's the difference. Everything is under God's rule, otherwise it would fall apart. But in heaven, that's the only realm where Satan, Satan has been thrown out. So his rebellion was squelched. We see that in Revelation 12, where Satan and his angels were thrown out of heaven. So there's perfect alignment in heaven under God and under the Lordship of Christ. There's no sin, there's no sorrow, there's no sickness, there's no deviation away from the will of God. How many know that? So Jesus told us to bring his kingdom or his reign or his rule or his government on earth, not just on Sunday in a building for two hours. On earth, somebody say on earth. He said you are the salt of the earth, not the salt of the church, the light of the world, not the light of the church, which implies you're called to bring his reign as a plumber and as a preacher, as a politician, as an economist, as a judge, as a teacher. The whole earth is the Lord's, it says in Psalm 24, in the fullness thereof. Psalm 103 says his kingdom rules over all. And that's the theme of the whole Bible, the book of uh, Daniel especially. So you see his kingdom rules over all. That's why it can't be the church. The church doesn't rule. The institutional church is not called to rule over all. But as individuals, we are called to bring his government on earth as it is in heaven. And the corporate church obviously is behind the discipleship of those people and the influence of those people, but it would never be right for one church or one denomination to rule a government because when that has happened, it's been disastrous in church history anyway. But I don't believe that's what it's referring to. It's talking about us being the light. So I believe in the separation of church and state. I do believe in that as the original frame is meant it, not the way they say it today. But I do not believe in the separation of God and state. So God's law word needs to go forth through us, whether you're a preacher or a plumber, through us to every realm of life that we are assigned to, whether it's being a parent, a teacher, a preacher, a plumber, a politician, an economist, whatever you're called to be, an athlete, a military man, whatever, you are called to bring whatever you know of God's reign from his word into that realm and make disciples according to that assignment you have so that you are now systemically affecting your realm of influence. You're not just winning individual sinners. Does that make sense? And so when we combine the gospel with the kingdom, we're not only bringing individual sinners to heaven, we're redeeming communities. We are changing systems because when sin proliferates, it becomes systemic, whether it's racism, communism, uh, whatever, you know, you can mention so many isms, even religious things that are not right, religions that are not right. So you have whole systems of thought that the enemy hides behind. And that's why it tells us in 2 Corinthians 10 that we are to cast down every thought, systems of thought that comes against the knowledge of God. That's not just individual minds, that's a command to the Corinthian church to deal with that in Corinth, meant to change the culture of the city. So when you understand even Acts 1-8, it totally 
when you look at the Bible through the lens of the kingdom, it changes everything, even simple passages. I won't get into it, even John 3, 16 and 1 Timothy 3, 15, it's all in my book, 25 Things You Never Heard in Church. But Acts 1, 8 is an example. Jesus said, I've called you to have power, right? You will have power after that, the Holy Ghost come upon you, not to speak in tongues or to move in the word of knowledge or prophecy. He says, so you can be my witnesses. I know a lot of people who speak in tongues who aren't his witnesses. Speaking in tongues is a means to an end, not the end, but the Pentecostals have made it the end. They said the full gospel is I speak in tongues. No, no, the full gospel is when you believe the whole gospel and bring it on earth as it is in heaven. And so he says, I want you to be my witnesses. Then he said in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Simple, right? Church doesn't understand that today. You see, he said that I want you to be my witnesses. That is to say, I want you to bring the gospel, the kingdom, and plant it in cities. He didn't say buildings. He didn't say, I want you to be my witnesses in a synagogue. He didn't say, I want you to be my witnesses on Sunday for two hours in a building and, or in the upper room. He said, I want you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. By implication, I want you to bring the reign of God in Jerusalem on earth as it is in heaven. God has called us to plant and permeate communities, not just buildings. Then he said, Judea, which by implication means you're not ever supposed to plant a church, you're supposed to plant a movement. Because you're not only supposed to have influence in your surrounding community where everybody looks like you, talks like you, has the same culture. Now you have to go to Judea, to the region, then Samaria, which represents people that you hate and hate you. They're against you ideologically to have a different twist on religion. Then even further to the ends of the earth, now you're going to cannibals and pagans and polytheists and people who are really out of this world. At least the Samaritans had a semi-Jewish heritage. They were half Jewish, half Assyrian. They hated the Jews. The Jews hated them. But now I want you to go to the Goyim. I want you to go to the pagans, which means the gospel is transhistorical, transgenerational, multicultural. The gospel fits every culture. And that's why we're not called just to preach or hang out with people who look like us and talk like us. So we're called to plant the gospel in cities, in cultures, in people groups. When he says in Matthew 28, 19, I want you to disciple nations. That word nation means people groups, not just individual ethnics. And every people group, and that also implies subcultures like baseball, that's a people group. Uh, people who like ping pong, that's a people group. The PTA, that's a people group. Martial arts is a people group. Uh, Every subculture should be permeated with the gospel. So he's saying, I want you to disciple people groups and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So what he's talking about is every people group or subculture you're a part of, you should permeate with my reign and that will change the systems and redeem that aspect of culture. Does that make sense? So the kingdom of God is the rule of God that comes from the throne of God. The kingdom of God is not the church. The church is the main agent of the kingdom called to be the salt and light and bring his reign to the world. And once we understand that, it changes the nature of a church. It's not an entertainment center and it's not just a worship center. It's primarily an equipping and discipleship center it doesn't matter how many people you get in a building on Sunday. What matters is how many you send out of the building into the community on Monday. When you understand the gospel, the kingdom, the church gathered becomes, the church gathered on Sunday becomes the church scattered on Monday. In other words, when you say I'm going to church, you don't understand what you're talking about. You are the church. When you look at a building and say that's a church, that means you've been brainwashed. It's not a church. It's a building that houses the church. See, you are the church, so you're gathered on Sunday to be equipped to be scattered on Monday to bring the reign of God into every aspect of culture. That's what this is about. Now, when we think about the gospel, 
The gospel in Paul's day had two connotations. As a Jew, he had the connotation of uh, passages in the Bible and also in second, second Temple literature. Some of it would be called apocalyptical literature, and uh, some of it was in the Apocrypha. But uh, not to get into all that, but they had an understanding of the gospel um, framed like this. Isaiah 52, verse 7, it says, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, the gospel, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. Someone say, your God reigns. So you see the good news is connected with what? The kingdom. Verse 8, listen, watchmen, lift up your voices, shout joyfully together, where they will see their, with their own eyes when the Lord restores Zion. There's a lot I could say about that. Break forth, shout joyfully together, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted and redeemed his people uh, in Jerusalem. And so when it's talking about restoring Zion, that was talking about how the, uh, the Jewish people were at, in the future, he was prophesying, we're going to be in captivity. He gets into this in Isaiah 45 and 46, 47 as well. He, they were going to experience a Babylonian captivity and then a Persian captivity uh, and eventually a Roman captivity. And so what he was doing is he was connecting the good news with a salvation that was real life salvation. Do you see the implications of that? Had to do with political economic liberation, not just, they weren't even thinking about going to heaven actually. They were talking about, they all assumed they were going to heaven. The focus, even what Jesus said as a good Jew, was he said to pray for God's kingdom to come on earth. The fo focus was never going to heaven in the rapture. The rap, look, when the church separated the gospel from the kingdom, it went from engaging the earth to escaping the earth. God has called us to focus on the earth. The Bible is not a book about heaven. The Bible says very little about heaven. The Bible is the most practical book ever written on how to bring God's reign in a practical way to the earth. In other words, it's a book about how do we manage the planet and steward the earth, not just go to heaven. So when we look at the Jew, Paul, from sitting under Gamaliel being a Pharisee of Pharisees, his pretext, his understanding, his preamble, if you will, for good news was framed by being a Jew and that had to do with deliverance from their enemies. Sort of like the theme in the book of Exodus when God delivered the Jews from slavery. What was that? Political and economic bondage. If all he wanted him to do was praise the Lord, he would have told him, be a good slave, just hang out and praise me. No, you can't use your creativity and you can't really worship God if somebody has you in bondage. So the whole Exodus narrative is a type of the kingdom. It's part of that whole big story of redemption. And it shows that God wants you to have economic freedom he wants you to have the creativity, the ability to worship me as an image bearer of God to steward the earth. Worship is not just singing songs in the context of the Old Testament. One of the major words for worship is the word work in the Old Testament. So whatever you do that God wired you to do, whether it's to be a professor in a school, a military man, an athlete, parent, whatever, you do it unto the Lord, that's an act of worship. So worship is work. It's vocation. In other words, you come on Sunday and you're equipped. You worship with the Psalms, the hymns, the spiritual songs. But then you worship on Monday by using the God-given gifts to bring his reign by walking in a spirit of excellence like Daniel did and showing as a witness of Christ, how the gospel really can matter in someone's life, in their marriage, their personal life, and whatever. 
So Paul, looking at uh, the gospel, the good news, uh, he had an understanding of good news connected with liberation, connected with uh, freedom, with creativity, even from the Exodus story. Does that make sense? Connected to coming out of bondage. The good news also had another connotation. During the time of Paul's conversion, um, the uh, day and age that he lived in, the good news was when a herald would go forth and announce when a new king was born or a new king was coronated. And they used to worship, starting with Augustus, they started worshiping Caesar. And so when the gospel was preached, when Jesus said, I'm preaching the gospel of the kingdom, that was totally antithetical to the Roman power base. That's why they crucified him. They didn't crucify Jesus because he preached a new religion. They crucified Jesus because he was a threat because he was saying, I am the king, as you guys sang. I am the king of kings, not Caesar, not Pontius Pilate, not Festus. I am the king of every king, the president of every president, the CEO of every CEO, the governor of every governor, the mayor of every mayor. That is his inheritance, that it's what he claimed to have. According to Psalm 2, when the father said to the son, ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. And when Jesus told us to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, he was telling us to proclaim his rule. That was his possession. And we ought to reign with him, which is our inheritance. It's his possession, it's our inheritance. Wow, it's powerful. When we use our faith just to believe God for a nice car, we're not getting it. We're called to believe God to subdue kingdoms. It says in Hebrews 11, not just for personal comfort, but to influence a whole culture. So when you separate the good news from the kingdom, you don't really have good news. You just have escapism, mysticism, and uh, another way of medicating yourself, just thinking about heaven and not dealing with the issues of life and culture. And so Paul thought of this backdrop of the gospel that was both Jewish but also secular. When he preached, Jesus is Lord, Lord, what does that mean? That doesn't just mean he's your personal savior. Do you realize what we've collapsed the gospel down to? Jesus is your personal existential savior so you could feel good. And we come to church to feel good. We come to church to get a word or get slain in the spirit or to soak. You don't understand the gospel. It's just another form of existentialism. The gospel by its own roots is confrontational to culture. It's good news to those who want to believe, but it's bad news to the principalities and powers who want to rule in their dark way. It's a threat to the power base of secular princes and governments that don't want God. It's a threat to what the culture celebrates. It's a threat to demonic hosts. And that's where the persecution comes. And so when Paul preached the gospel, and he preached that Jesus is Lord, man, that was a loaded statement. And that's why when Jesus said, I want you to be my witness in Jerusalem, powerful. That means permeate a city. And uh, I told you I was going to start with the Shema, but I don't think I'm going to have time to do that. So I want you to just see some of the effects of the gospel. Paul preached. Let's go to Acts chapter uh, 19. With that understanding of the gospel, it tells us in Acts 19, I'm not going to read the whole narrative, that Paul went to Ephesus. He found disciples. He always started with disciples, not just people showing up, not just crowds, but disciples. And it says 
that in verse 10, after he was lecturing in a hall for two years, this is the effect of what he preached. In verse 10 of Acts 19, it says, he lectured for two years so that all, somebody say all, all. who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. It affected, he was planting the gospel in a province, not in a building. And then we skip over this so much more I could say. Um, look at this, the effect of that gospel caused all sorts of demonic activity and uh, some evil spirit even beat up some false Christians who tried to use the name of Jesus and name of Paul, cast out a demon and this demon overpowered these seven sons of Sceva. And what was the result? Verse 17, this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus. Do you see that? The gospel affected a whole city. And listen to this, and fear fell upon them all. Not all Christians, all meaning the fear of God fell on the whole city. <laughs> oh my God. So that the name of Jesus was being magnified. It caused such a stir that people started burning their books on magic and witchcraft, stopped buying the idols erected to Artemis and Diana, changed the economics of a whole city so that in verse 23 it says, about that time there was no small disturbance concerning the way. Now the heathen don't care when we have nice churches because we don't preach the kingdom. We're happy with having a two hour service on Sunday, but we have no effect on Monday. But in that day, because they preached the gospel of the kingdom, it caused no small disturbance. Everywhere Paul went, there was either a riot or a revival, and most of the times it was both. It was never neutral. And then it says the whole city was in an uproar. They had a convocation, believe it or not, the two Greek words for the assembly, when the whole assembly of Ephesus came together, that was actually called the church. The assembly came together, the word is ecclesia, because when Jesus called his followers the ecclesia, he was calling them the new parliament or the new congress. We're not just called to be sent, we're called to lead. That's a whole nother message. It's in my book, Ruling the Gates. And so the whole city came together to vote on what to do with Paul and what to do with the way. And that word assemble is the same word we have for church. That word was a political word, not a religious word that Jesus used. And they came together because the economics were being affected. In the light of all this, Paul wrote about six years later, the book of Ephesians. And we're gonna skip, I'm so sorry, I didn't go to the Shamar and something else, but uh, would have helped. But Ephesians chapter one, I want you to see how Paul described the gospel. Ephesians chapter one could be broken down into what the Father did, what the Son did, and what the Holy Spirit is continuing to do but we're just gonna go right to the focus on the Son. In verse nine of Ephesians one, Paul says, in light of everything that happened, now you gotta understand, this is in the context of him looking back and trying to explain to them how they affected the economics of a whole city. He had to give them a theology as big as the kingdom. He was trying to explain to them why there was no small disturbance. He was trying to explain to them why it was normal they would affect all of culture, 
not just the lecture hall that he stayed in for two years. And in the context of what happened in Acts 19, six years later, he writes this, and he says in verse 9, he, meaning God, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his intention which he purposed in Christ. And so the mystery of his will had to do with his purpose, his intention in Christ. And what is that? In verse 10, this one verse explains the big story of Scripture. This is a summary of Old and New Testament, First and Second Testament, and the whole reason why we live connects it to Genesis 128, the original mandate given to Adam. Verse 10 explains what the mystery of his will is, or was, it shouldn't be a mystery now, that was purposed in Christ, and what is that? That in the administration of the fullness of time, that is to say God is managing time, managing history, so that there is going to be a consummation. This is where history is heading. If you want to know what the future is, this is what, I'm, what it, the future holds, what I'm about to read. So with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, all things will be summed up in Christ. Things that are in heaven and things on the earth in him. In other words, the gospel that we preached has to do with summing up or aligning or uniting, all of these are the same kind of words in Greek, uniting and aligning all things in heaven and earth. That's what Jesus told us to pray for, his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, his reign, his rule, his government to come on earth. This is what Paul preached. It was the uniting together of things in heaven and earth. In other words, the things that are invisible and the things visible, the things in the natural, the things in the spiritual, things that are in heaven, things that are on earth, the things that are not seen, the things that are materialistic. Everything, this pulpit is something. Mathematics is something that's a thing. Everything, not just spiritual things, not just prophecy, not just prayer, not just alone time with God, not just singing songs, uh, Pythagorean theorems and, uh, 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 you know, uh, metaph metaphysics and marine biology and laws of logic and laws of nature and, and uh, every possible natural phenomena that you could think of in the universe is included in this, that God is summing up. Politics, economics, business, music, art, entertainment, every realm, every person, and every system that supports every person. Everything is eventually going to be aligned and summarized in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. This is why when he preached the gospel, it wasn't just the gospel, it was the gospel, the reign of God. It affected every aspect of culture because it changed the way people lived. It changed their values. It changed the way they lived on Monday, not just Sunday. Then imagine the Bible without verses and chapters. That's the only way to interpret it. In order for you to get the fullness of this, the next verse says it all. I'm going to have to start with verse 9 again, and we're going to flow right into verse 11. So he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he uh, intended in Christ, with the view to the administration of the fullness of time, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on the earth, in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, which works all things after the counsel of his will. In other words, you see what he's saying there? Your inheritance is connected to the summing up of all things. And it says that he's working all things after the counsel of his will. That means if you're not bringing the reign of God and if you're not preaching the kingdom, you're actually not going and flowing with God. This is where he's heading. 
That's why as time gets closer to the second coming of Christ, the gospel of the kingdom is going to be proclaimed and understood more and more. More books will be written about it, more people will be preaching on it, and it will begin permeating all of the universities, the seminaries, and all Bible-believing churches eventually uh, in the world. And so our inheritance is a lot more than, this, than believing for a nice little car or that your kids won't backslide. And so what God is after is that we embrace the full gospel, the good news that is always connected to the reign of God. I was tempted to go to the Shema now, but I'm not. I just want us to pray. Is there anybody here who wants to be an agent of change in their community? Why don't you just come to the front? Just come to the front. You want to make that commitment. You want to be an agent of change. You want to use all your gifts and talents on Monday, not just Sunday. It's not just about Sunday ministry, it's about Monday work and vocation. Yeah, when you come up, this young man's got a right. Have your hands up, stop praying, praying in the spirit, whatever the hell you want to pray. But let's just believe God for an amazing release. This is an incredible church. It already preaches the kingdom. That's why there's freedom here to preach it. I don't have to deal with a lot of the basics. And God's about to burst forth and it's going to be an explosion of creativity in the community, not just in the church building. An explosion of creativity using your gifts and abilities in a way that's going to change the way people perceive life in general, the way they value things, the way they celebrate things, who they relate to, who they connect to. How they live out their faith in the context of their work, in the context of their Monday to Saturday space. Father, we just thank you for this amazing church. And Father, we thank you that you called us to be the ecclesia, those who come together to lead, come together to enact policy, come together to bring things on earth that are already decreed in heaven. Thank you, God, that you said that you've given us the keys of the kingdom so that whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatever we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. We thank you, God, that you said that you've given us those keys. And to us has been given the mysteries of the kingdom of God, according to Matthew 13. And we can understand and unpack all of this. And if we separate the gospel from the kingdom, even our revelation will be limited because you said you have given it to us to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. Forgive us for not preaching the kingdom or believing the kingdom and just having a good news without it. Oh God, use our gifts and talents to alleviate oppression, to alleviate slavery, to alleviate racism, to alleviate uh, injustice and inequity, to alleviate, uh, oh God, the divide between the ethnic groups. God, use us uh, to bring our creativity into Hollywood, uh, into film, music, art, education. Uh, God, uh, we pray for professors uh, of, of sociology and history and PhDs in microbiology and chemistry that will glorify you, that they will study the works of God according to Psalm 11 to glorify you. Oh God, we pray that even that we would study, as, as you said in Psalm 11, that, that your works are studied by all those who fear you. And so Lord, that we would understand our call to creation, to the created order, to the world, to the planet. 
not just to a building on Sunday. Oh, God, we pray. Oh, we just call forth the gifts right now. Whatever your gifts are, just call it forth. Call it forth, especially if there are gifts that are dormant. You might be in the financial industry. You might be in the political industry. You might be in the healthcare industry. You might be uh, uh, somebody who's in the teaching industry. I believe there's a vestige, there's a DNA of Jesus given to everybody in the church. Everybody has some kind of uh, DNA of his ministry, of some kind of apostolic, prophetic, pastoral teaching uh, or, or evangelistic kind of DNA that they will use to fill up the earth with his glory according to Ephesians 4, 10 to 12. Uh, oh God, uh, uh, the teachers would come forth. Uh, the evangelists, the salesmen, the marketers would come forth. The prophets, the prognosticators, the creators, the creative culture people, uh, 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 the cultural creatives would come forth in this house. The apostolic leaders, those who could start franchises and businesses and be pioneers, uh, be innovators, be people that would replicate businesses, replicate systems, uh, create systems uh, that would change other systems and replace that there would be uh, systems that would be created and come forth uh, that would contravene ungodly systems. Oh God, the pastors in the midst, those in healthcare, those who are nurses, those who are in psychiatry, psychology, they have that pastoral kind of gift. Oh God, that care, that gift to show compassion and mercy and empathy for others. God, that those pastors would come forth. And it's not just in the church. They don't have to be a spiritual leader to walk in that DNA. You have the fivefold in the church that are the spiritual leaders, but you also have vestiges of your gifts to come forth to everybody. Oh God. I'm going to end with this prayer, Lord, that the full ministry and breath of none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the ruler of all the kings of the earth, who come forth through your people. In Jesus' name.